the ones we've been waiting for. Good morning. Manuela Pachuto is a name my parents blessed me with 32 years ago as my mother cradled me in her arms. As a child, my dreams to change the world were big, bold, bright. But as I grew older, I came to believe they were only that, dreams. Society had no room for the ambitions of a girl from northern Uganda who hawked fruit juice on the streets of Kampala to help her mother I learned very quickly that family is a support system. It's the backbone of our society, the unit of a country, and the DNA of a continent. But the idea of family somehow clashed with the reality of my workplace. As a young lactating mother who had gained an education and pursued a fulfilling career, my deep desire to raise my children was confused for lack of professional ambition and seen as weakness. How could the ability to bring forth human life be the very thing that crushed my dreams? And so one gray morning, I walked out on a corporate job and onto something I call the higher purpose supporting mothers to win both in the workplace and in their homes. Not only because women matter or that children matter, but that the dreams of every woman matters. There were disapproving looks and daunting whispers that insinuated that I wasn't ready, that I was young, foolish, and, and inexperienced. But with the support of my family, I started my company, The Cradle, Uganda's first childcare center designed to partner with mothers to raise their children while allowing them to fully maximize their potential in the workplace. Through our work, more women are able to sit in boardrooms, in parliament, in cockpits. They serve in the army in laboratories, in their businesses, and walk long, hard hours in hospitals during epidemics. Being an Obama leader was possible for me because my mother sacrificed her dreams. And so I dedicate my work to women like her so that other women don't have to make that choice. Today, we listen to a leader who was cradled in the dreams of his father raised by his mother, and rose with the backing of community to take his place in history. He knows that leadership knows no background, no age, no race, no gender. He has taught us that no matter who you are, you are the one we've been waiting for. And so could we stand to our feet with a round of applause and African ululations welcome the 44th president of the United States of America, President Barack Obama. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Everybody have a seat. We're going to be here a while. I'm going to try to not leave anybody out. Let's see. Uh, Tobela, Malwini, Sanibona, Dumelang, Undaya, Reperela, Reperili. How's it? That's Hawaiian. It's good to see all of you. 
How's everybody doing today? Everybody's doing good? So they have me, they, they've got these remarks I'm supposed to read before we start talking. So let me, let, let, me, uh, let me see what I've got to say here. It's great to be with all of you. Young people, young leaders from all across the continent. I gave a long speech yesterday, so I'm going to give a very short one today. I want to tell you a little bit about how uh, you came to be here, because uh, it, it speaks to my own journey. You know, uh, when I was president of the United States, uh, even starting with my first year, when we traveled, I instructed the State Department and my national security team that whenever possible, when I went to a new country, I didn't just want to meet with the ministers and the presidents and the prime ministers and the, all those people. What I wanted to do was I wanted to meet with young people from these countries uh, because what I felt was that um, if, if I could access uh, those who are just coming into their own and who are still open to new ideas and, and don't, uh, don't yet have enough experience uh, to not tell the truth about what's happening in their countries, that I would learn more, uh, that it would give me a better feel for what, uh, what was happening in the country and uh, we could then be more effective in the work that we did uh, in our foreign policy. So I would have these town hall meetings all around uh, the world and when we came to South Africa, uh, we hosted our town hall in Soweto. And we could only fit about 500 people there. And we realized, obviously, the demand was a little higher. More people wanted to come than we could accommodate. So I'm not that good at technology. Well, I'm getting a little better. But uh, somebody says, well, what we should do is we should live stream it. And I said, what does that mean? <laughs> somebody explained it to me. Um, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Uh, so we set it up, and then somebody said, well, you know what we could do is we can live stream it to four or five different countries, and they can have participants who can even ask you questions from these remote sites, from Kampala or from Nairobi or, and, and Lagos. And, and so we ended up setting up... Uh, a town hall that didn't just include the 500 in the auditorium, not just all of South Africa uh, available, uh, televised, but now people all across the continent. And I, I think somehow we ended up having 20 million or 30 million people watch this town hall. Um, I couldn't get through all the questions, as you might imagine. And we thought, man, there are a lot of young people all across this continent who are hungry for change, are doing amazing things. How can we capture that energy? So we initiated this program called Young African Leaders Program. Ultimately, uh, having talked to the Mandela family, we started calling it Mandela Fellows. And, and the Young African Leaders Program, YALI, would bring fellows to the U.S., match them with uh, institutions that were already uh, doing the kind of work that they were interested in doing. And we ended up getting like 50,000 applications for 500 slots. So that first class was amazing, remarkable. Uh, in fact, uh, if I am not mistaken, uh, the, the person who has helped put this academy together is a YALI alumni. Um, but... We thought, what are we going to do with the other 49,500? So we started creating uh, a digital network, and we started doing regional workshops. And 
would connect people together. And we said, well, if, if this is good for Africa, then why not try it in Southeast Asia? And same thing happened. And then why not try it in Latin America? Same interest, same demand. And what it reminded me was the fact that all around the world, you have peers, you have kindred spirits who are ready to remake business, the nonprofit sector, politics, journalism, who are doing amazing things but so often feel isolated in your respective communities and don't have the support and the framework that allows you uh, to scale up fast and, and to learn from not just your mistakes but other people's mistakes and that can bolster you when you're feeling discouraged and uh, uh, congratulate you when you succeed. So I knew that when I left office, this was going to be the thing that would inspire me the most, uh, to be able to interact with you and work with you and uh, help you change the world. And in the same way that we started the Young Leaders programs when I was in office here on this continent, we thought it made sense to start the Obama Youth Summit here in Africa as well. And that's not only, and that's not only because Africa is one of the fastest growing regions in the world with surging access to the internet and mobile technology and historic gains in health and education and poverty. Uh, it's also because this is the youngest continent. And so if, if this continent's going to move, it's going to be because of you. Uh, and you know, it's fitting that so much of the world is, is here this week to celebrate Nelson Mandela. Uh, most people around the world think of Mandela as an older man with hair like mine. <laughs> what people, of course, don't recall is, is that he started as a very young man, your age, trying to liberate his country. Um, he then inspired me, and I got started in my work uh, when uh, I was about your age, although all of you have done much more at your age than I was able to do in mine. Um, and and you know, when I think about when I was at your, your phase, part of uh, what was challenging for me is I, I didn't have a lot of role models in the immediate vicinity. I didn't have a lot of organizations who were doing the kinds of things that I thought needed to be done. Uh, and so I ended up, uh, I think, piecing together from what I was able to read or see or hear about all the different types of movements that were happening. And one of the places I looked at was South Africa. And I learned about the courage of those who waged the defiance campaign uh, and the cruelty and brutality inflicted on innocent men, women, and children uh, from Sharpeville to Soweto. And I studied Biko's words and Mandela's example uh, in the same way that I studied the civil rights movement in my own country, in the same way that I studied uh, what had been happening uh, in Central Europe and, and, and uh, solidarity and uh, the union movement there. And so it awoke something in me and, and what I hope will happen as a consequence of this group coming together is that you have a little more direct contact with the people who are doing the things you want to do and uh, a little more direct help in getting you to where you want to go. Uh, and um, a community that you will build together over time all across the continent. Uh, already we have thousands of young people who are connected. We've got resources. We've got training. We've got networks. We've got a whole bunch of folks sitting in the back who are like my age, really ancient, um, 
uh, who, uh, who've already accomplished extraordinary things uh, in various fields. You've met some of them during the course of the last few days. And all of them want to invest in some fashion in you. Uh, but what we found in this program that, that we've been setting up is the most valuable asset uh, is going to turn out to be uh, the collaborations and the conversations you have with each other. And I think that uh, al already a lot of you are starting to realize that. So uh, I could not be prouder of what you've already accomplished. But when, uh, when we get all of you together in one room, man, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And it, it's, 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 it's giving us some small sense right now of the, the remarkable transformations that collectively uh, you are going to be able to make manifest uh, in, uh, in this continent and, and beyond. So let's get to work. All right? Thank you, everybody. Now, all right, so here's the deal. Uh, those of you who, a few of you may have been, you know, seen me in town halls or something. I just call on people and we just talk. So you don't have to, I notice this is not a shy group. So it, I'm not going to have to encourage that. Um, the, the, the only rule I'm going to have is, is that when I call on you, you've got to stand up, introduce yourself, uh, explain in one sentence what you're doing, and then... Uh, either offer the question or the comment, all right? Um, and I'm going to start with two people who submitted their questions on Slack. Uh, and we're going to start there in part because we want you guys to stay connected on, a, on platforms like Slack, all right? So after that, then we're going to open it up. The first person I'm going to call on is Temitope. Where, where are you? Right here. Temitope Isidoro from Nigeria. Good to see you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, <laughs> um, good to see you too. Um, uh, um, I am the programs manager at AfriLabs which is a network of um, technology ops on the continent. Okay. Okay, so my question has to do with uh, the brain drain that Africa is currently experiencing. So we, uh, we know that Africa's best are actually living in the continent in droves. Western countries are specifically designing immigration policies to entice the continent's best. How can Africa still achieve our immense potential in the face of this brain drain? Uh, when I graduated from university, I had so many friends doing wonderful things, like myself and all that. The key, the issue now is that most of these friends are out of the continent. They are scattered all over the globe mm. while I'm right, I'm right in, on the continent, right. trying still trying to do something. Now, the, the, the attraction is there to actually abandon everything and leave. So how do we convince people like me, like everybody here, to stay back and not just go? Okay. Well... Did everybody catch the question? Or do, uh, I'll just repeat it uh, briefly. The, the, the question is, uh, how do we think about the brain drain of talent from the continent? Uh, and that's obviously relevant to all of you because uh, uh, many of you have gotten fancy college educations or professional degrees or you have some sort of skill set that might be in high demand in this global economy. And... Uh, it may be tempting, and you may have relatives who are in Toronto or New York or uh, London or you know, Fort Wayne, Indiana. You know, I, you know they're, they're, they're uh, Africans everywhere. Um, it, it's, it's a real issue, and it's a real problem. In fact, the speech that I gave yesterday uh, referred to this process of globalization and part of what has happened is that 
Um, the, the internet, the global supply chain, has connected the world like never before, which means that if you have a skill that is in high demand, now you have a, a worldwide market that is interested in your skills. And uh, more and more, not only are we seeing concentrations of wealth, but we're also seeing concentrations of talent in various global centers, right? Whether it's Shanghai or Dubai or, right? Uh, and, and, and along with that concentration of talent and wealth, then be, uh, you see concentrations of uh, uh, power that ends up tilting in, in the further in the direction of inequality. And I think everybody here is going to have to look inside themselves. There's not going to be a magic answer for uh, how to deal with this because uh, each individual is going to have to ask themselves where do they want to make their life? Where do they want to put down their stake? But what I do believe is that if we have African uh, leaders, governments, and institutions that are creating the platform for success and opportunity, then you will increasingly get more and more talent wanting to stay. And once you hit a tipping point, then not only will you start slowing the brain drain, but in fact, it'll start reversing. The, the, so the issue then becomes, how do we, for example, create uh, a, a situation where if you want to start a business, you don't have to pay huge amounts of bribes or you don't have to be connected with the right family in order to get it going or are you able to access credit with relative ease in order to start your nonprofit, right? Um, there are certain things that government can do. Uh, I, I was speaking to uh, I, this wonderful group, and uh, remind me, uh, Cameroon? Ernest. So Ernest was talking about Cameroon, and there's a civil conflict there. Well, you know, it, it, it's harder to get people to stay if there are a bunch of people shooting at each other. So, so, so there's some things that government will have to do. But here's one thing I will, uh, I, I've observed. The amount of impact you can have in your home countries, precisely because there may be a less, uh, less of a concentration of talent. If, if you're willing to take the risk and undergo some of the challenges and the hardships, your chances, your odds of being transformative, of, of shaking things up, of, of helping more people are going to be higher here than they are in, in some major world capital. Um, man, it, it, if any of you come to America, you'll do wonderful stuff, but it's less likely that you revolutionize how education is done in America than it is how you revolutionize education in Tunisia. It's less likely that you're going to revolutionize farming in the United States. Farming's already pretty well developed. You know, if you drive through some cornfields in Iowa, they know how to farm. There's a lot of corn there. The problem in, the, in places like the United States is not uh, not enough food. It's, uh, it's, it's what to do with all the food we've got. But in, in my father's uh, traditional village in Kenya, a place called Kogelo, where my sister just set up a, a, uh, a youth center, you, you drive by a, a, a little hectare of maize, and, you know, they're all drooping, and there's one... You know, every, every two feet. <laughs> and it's just wildly inefficient. You go there, and you, you've got, uh, 
you know, skills and, and knowledge and technology about how to improve agricultural yields without huge amounts of capital inputs, suddenly you can change that whole village, that whole region, that whole country, right? So, so part of the question I think each of you end up having to ask yourselves is, is how big are your ambitions? Huh? And, and I would argue that if you've got really big ambitions, then you're going to stay here. You know, if you want a comfortable life, then you know, obviously uh, there are going to be a lot of takers all around the world. Um, last point I'm going to make about this, and, and this goes back to the issue of, of how it's going to be very hard to separate government from, and politics from economics and social development. Um, if you create the right conditions and you get that tipping point, um, then the, the, the cultural sense of belonging and ownership that you will feel from that accomplishment, I think, can be satisfying in a way that would be different if you are you know, just doing well someplace else. I, mean, I, I think it, it can affect your, your heart as well. And, and one, of, one of the things I'm noticing is in China now, uh, if you go to Shanghai or uh, Beijing, uh, a lot of Chinese students who studied in the United States and used to feel as if, if I want to start a company, I've got to stay in Silicon Valley or Austin, Texas or Boston. Now they're all like, oh, no, I, <laughs> I need to get back to Shanghai because that's where things are happening. Um, so so if, if the government are doing just the bare minimum, just the basics, no shooting, <laughs> minimize bribes, <laughs> uh, build some infrastructure and, 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 and uh, regular electricity, right? I mean, I mean, we're not talking about complicated stuff. Then, uh, fairly quickly, you can start seeing things starting to reverse. All right? Excellent question. Uh, oh, I got to check to see who's next. Uh, Lillian Otisor from Kenya. Abari. Zuri sana. Hey. <laughs> so, hi, Mr. President. Um, I'm Lillian from Kenya. I work in HIV. I work for a Kenyan NGO, and we focus on the vulnerable groups and reaching them for HIV and gender-based violence services. Right. Um, my question is, the world is facing a leadership crisis with a lot of hate and negativity. In Africa, our political leaders continue to be greedy, corrupt, and tribal. In some cases, we have used the vote to get fresh new blood, but they seem to get caught up in the same bad habits. Um, what advice would you give young aspiring leaders who feel disillusioned to participate in politics or other government positions, fearing the negative practices those offices seem to come with and the possibility of selling our souls? Oh, Lord. <laughs> you know, when I, uh, I, I was mentioning how, how I started having my early political awakening when I was about your age, maybe uh, around 21, 22, I started to really think, how can I change the world? And uh, I wanted no part of electoral politics because my attitude was what you just described. I thought, you know, they all seem kind of slick and phony and, uh, yeah, I didn't really trust them and, and so what I believed in was social movements. You know, my inspiration was, was Gandhi and King, and uh, my, my notion was how do I mobilize grassroots to put pressure on politicians so they're responsive and accountable, but not necessarily want to be, uh, wanting to be a, a politician myself. Um, and so I, I became a community organizer, and I worked in low-income areas, and I, so, so I did a lot of the kinds of work that you are doing now. And I, 
the, the amount of, of knowledge and, and love and wisdom that I gained from working at the community level, uh, it transformed me. It, it made me grow up, made me in, into a man. Uh, but what I noticed was the decisions that were being made uh, were not being made in the, the local neighborhood where I was working. They were being made someplace else. And so I was constantly thinking, how do I get more levers, more, more uh, leverage to affect change at the local level? And I started looking at City Hall and, and how decisions were being made at the city level. Then I started looking at, well, funding for education. That was affected at the state level in, in, in America. And, and then there was, a, there was a steel plant that had closed because this is at a time when a lot of manufacturing in America was moving overseas to, to look for cheaper labor. And those decisions weren't even being made in the city. They were being made in New York by some financiers. Uh, and so I thought, okay, I, I need more knowledge. I need to, to figure out how I can get more leverage, and I ended up going to law school. Even when I got out of law school, I still was not interested in politics, and I started practicing civil rights law and voting rights law, thinking that a, a more direct way of change than purely the local level was now to get people mobilized to vote to impact uh, those decision makers somewhere else. And then it just so happened that there was a, a seat for a local government office uh, that opened up and some people said, well, you, you, you know, you're talking all the time, Mr. Big Talk, why don't you, <laughs> why don't you try it out? And I, and, and I did and, and, and I won. Um, and I, you know, when I reflect back on my career, there was sort of a fork in the road at that point, and and all of us in in our lives will will come to forks in the road where, you know, that way offers a, a, a vision of a life uh, that has some pluses and some minuses, and then that fork same thing, and I you know I, I took this one. It worked out. I ended up being a fairly successful politician. Um, uh, but there are times where I reflect and say, you know, had I not decided to run and I had decided to take what I had learned in my law practice and I would started building a local organization and trying to scale it up and do more economic development in, in low-income communities, start first in Chicago, and we built a good model, and then I transported that to Los Angeles or New York or you know, other cities and began to network with people who were doing urban development and poverty uh, alleviation and education programs around the world, I might have had a, a, a significant impact that way too. So I guess th the point of the story is there's no one way of doing it. I think there are a lot of different ways in which you can effectuate change. The one thing you can't do is pretend that politics doesn't matter and say to yourself, uh, that's too corrupt, that's too broken, I'm not going to get involved in that. Because at some point, if you are ambitious about what you're doing in your home country, you will confront politics. You're going to want to build a center, and now you need approvals uh, in order to get the land. And s suddenly the governor decides, ah, you know, what's in it for me? <laughs> and you're going to have to deal with that. You're going to need some financing. If you go to the local bank, well, suddenly the bank says, ah, well, who sent you? <laughs> right? Uh, so suddenly, politics is mismanaged in your country, and next thing you know, uh, right in the middle of you trying to build your center, there's an ethnic conflict going on, and everything shuts down for six months, and your project stops, and 
because people are scared. Yeah. So you can't avoid government and you can't avoid politics. And, and then the question becomes, all right, how do I want to engage it? Do I want to run for office? Some people have the personality and the inclination to do that. Some people don't. You know, they may not want to be the public face of something. Other people will say, okay, I don't want to run, but I think I can help organize and manage the efforts of people who I think are sincere and have integrity. And so they'll be involved in the political world, but in a different way. Some people may say, I don't want to be involved at all in campaigning, but I do want to mobilize people to vote and participate. Some people may be journalists, and they say, my job is to hold politicians accountable and make sure that we're shining a light on how public monies are being spent and how decisions are being made. All that is contributing to the quality of government. And so you don't have an excuse to say, this is too corrupt and I'm going to be selling my soul. Find a way where you're not selling your soul. But you still have to be involved in government and in politics. Um, and, 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 and look, I, I, I don't want to make light of the fact that uh, some countries, being involved in politics is dangerous. Uh, you know, there, there's some places where reporting on what's really happening can land you in jail. Uh, and, and I am never going to be somebody who uh, urges people to do things uh, and, and just ignore the consequences of, of the decisions. People have families, people uh, you know, have children. You know, there, there are risks that each of us have to measure in terms of uh, how far we're willing, willing to go which is partly why my, my final piece of advice about politics is uh, do not do it alone. Um, Africa, like a lot of places, has a history of charismatic leaders around which everybody rallies, but not as effective about creating collective organizations and collective leadership. And the problem with charismatic leaders is, A, if they end up not turning out as wonderful as you'd like, uh, things can be worse if they're charismatic and they consolidate power and then they uh, do whatever they want. Problem number two is if they die, now suddenly, all the energy that's been built dissipates. Problem number three is governance is not the same as getting elected. And a lot of times, somebody who's a charismatic leader may not know how to set up effective schools <laughs> or properly administer a budget. And so, so the goal of, of politics is not just getting elected, the goal is governing in a way that improves people's lives. And that requires a collective. That requires a team with people of di different expertise. So, so as you are thinking about government politics and your role in relation to it, think about how can you find like-minded people whose values you share, whose vision you share, and how can you collectively then start uh, doing the work to bring about changes. And maybe it starts at the local level. Maybe it starts uh, uh, at a regional level as opposed to national right away. Huh? Um, I sure hope, though, you, you, you get involved some way. Women in particular, by the way, I want you to get more involved because, because uh, Men have, men have been getting on my nerves lately. I mean, I, I just, uh, every day I read the newspaper and I just think, like, brothers, what's wrong with you guys? I mean, what's wrong with us? All right? I mean, we're, we're violent, we're 
bullying. We, you know, just not handling our business. Um, so, so I think uh, empowering more women on the continent, that ought to, right away is going to, I think, lead to some better policies. So, all right. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Everybody just, just stay in your seats. Don't, uh, I'm not going to suddenly uh, call on you. Just, okay. Um, this gentleman right here. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. So, His Excellency Julius Bill, Mada Bill of Sierra Leone, recently appointed me as the country's first Chief Innovation Officer. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And in your presidency, um, you created and worked with institutions like USDS, um, Digital Services, and 18F to um, build institutions that focus on transforming the lives of citizens through technology and innovation, mm -hmm. like healthcare.gov, which had challenges, but obviously um, impacted millions of people. So the question is, for some of us who are thinking about actually doing and driving innovation across and within government for um, service delivery and citizen engagement and thinking about the ecosystem, what leadership models and, and advice um, would you offer to us such that we're able to not only engage the people within government, bring resources from outside, but as you mentioned, um, work with the fundamental uh, authorizing environments, that is the citizens, the citizens themselves, who will absorb those innovations. Thank you. Well, uh, I think it's a great sign that your government recognizes the opportunities. Um, and each country here is going to vary in terms of the, the platforms, the infrastructure that exist. The great thing that we're seeing, all of you know this better than I do, is that here in, on the continent, and it's similar in, in uh, parts of Asia, uh, you're leapfrogging all the old uh, legacy technologies that uh, you know, we had to build out in the United States, right? Everybody's laying all these lines and all this stuff, and suddenly here, people are just dropping a bunch of uh, cell towers uh, fairly efficiently, and everybody's got a phone, and in, in some ways you are ahead of uh, what's happening back home uh, in, in terms of people seeing the, the constant day-to-day -day utility of transactions and uh, communications and banking and all kinds of stuff just off uh, a remote device. Uh, so the opportunities, I think, are vast to, to directly engage with citizens uh, and, and make sure that they are getting everything they can out of government in an effective and efficient way. Um, in, in terms of how you, you organize uh, a team internally, uh, what, what I've found is that um, initially at least what works best is have a very specific problem that you're trying to solve uh, rather than uh, bringing together a, a bunch of people to sit around the room and say, hey, what can we do with neat technology? And doing a bunch of, uh, hot, you know, abstract theoretical uh, conceptualization. Uh, instead, think about, what are we trying to make sure that our local farmers know their prices for their crops and they can get them to market fairly? And is there a way for us to make sure that that's posted every day so that they are getting full value? Right? That's a very specific problem in which now the, your technologists can go out with, the, uh, with people who are doing agricultural policy, sit down with a bunch of farmers, look at who's, who are the middlemen, how's the market working, what are the specific barriers or roadblocks, or what would be the information that would solve the particular problem that that small farmer is having. And now, in an iterative fashion, you are designing 
something for them. Right? And then next, okay, uh, on education, how do we, the, the, the thing we want to do is we want to make sure that young people who may not have access to uh, enough teachers, so I, I was mentioning in, in my father's village, you've got one teacher for every 78 children. That's a lot of kids per child. This is a very rural, remote area. So, so what are the specific things that we could do to uh, be a force multiplier, to, to in, enhance and increase the, the ability of a teacher? If, if, if you can't afford a whole bunch of, the best thing to do, obviously, would be to hire five more teachers. But if you can't do that, are there ways in which we can set up uh, a laptop or, or, or a, a, an iPad that helps the teacher track student progress in a more efficient way so at least they can spot who is having trouble with this you know, arithmetic problem. Right? So, so, so I, I think the, the more you're focusing on specific problems, um, then I th what you'll discover is you can build out a team fairly quickly. And what I also believe is if, uh, if your government is clever and willing to throw its weight around a little bit, you will get companies to volunteer, provide a, a supplementary workforce that will help you solve the problem uh, for free. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned, for, for those of you uh, who are less familiar with this, uh, I'd, I'd won this healthcare battle. Uh, we're the only uh, advanced country in the world that really doesn't have universal healthcare. We made a huge stride with the, this legislation we passed. We had to set up a platform because of procurement issues and uh, uh, the U.S. government is terrible about buying software. Uh, the thing didn't work when it was supposed to. So we had to scramble to fix it. And essentially, we just called up Facebook, Google, Stripe. Uh, you know, we had a bunch of friends in Silicon Valley, and we said, send us some engineers to help figure this out. And what you discovered was that in every one of these companies, there are coders, engineers, um, who are well compensated, are really top of the line in terms of what they do. Um, but you know what? They don't always have a sense of purpose about their work. Right? They're, they're designing some algorithm for some new version of, you know, NBA 2K, and that's nice, but they don't feel like they're having an impact. And what we found was we could get people to volunteer for six months, a year, in some cases two years, to just come and work and, and solve a problem. So, so that, I think, you'll, you'll find, if you have clarity about what it is that uh, you're trying to get done, you'll be able to uh, mobilize resources for it. Now, all this presumes, obviously, sort of a base network that, and that the government possesses, a, a platform off of which you can work. Uh, and, and I'm not the expert on this, but we can get you in contact with experts uh, to learn from mistakes that have been made. Uh, and, and that's something that I think is part of the function of, of this group, right, is, is, is to put you in touch with people who know more than I do, certainly, about it. All right? Uh, young lady in the uh, red? Just speak up a little bit, even though I can hear you, but I want to make sure everybody can. My name is ah. Hoden Osman, and I'm a senator from Somalia. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask you a question. Somalia, with the longest coastal in our continent, 
about 3,300 square, square mile, and especially economic zone, almost a million square, is devastated by illegal fishing and estimated to cost Somalia 400 million to 600 million annually. Why is the international community is slow to address this serious problem that particularly hits hard federal countries and development coastal states that don't have the resources to control their territorial waters? When piracy was a serious global problem, advancing affecting global trade, the international community took decisive action through the UN Security Council. However, the international community is reluctant to take a decisive action against illegal fishing that affects our region. Is there a double standard? Thank you. Yes, there is a double standard. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, rich countries, if it's their boats that are being pirated, they will come in and protect them. If, on the other hand, it's their boats that are scooping up all the fish, they're not going to do anything about it. So, yeah, there's a double standard. Now, that doesn't mean we can't try to reduce the hypocrisy and actually address the issues. Um, and, and I'll just make a, a, a couple of quick points. No, number one, um, I mean, Somalia is just barely beginning to reconstitute itself as a functioning government. And uh, the, I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. If you have chronic civil war and chronic violence in your countries, then a whole lot of things are going to go wrong. And so fishing, overfishing in Somalia is, let's face it, one of the least problems that Somalia has faced over the last 20 years because people have just been fleeing for their lives or trying to avoid, you know, uh, organizations blowing up their cities or their towns. Uh, and, and, and that goes back to the point I made earlier. Politics and governance matters. And, and, and we can't run around that. Now, having said that, uh, I do believe that there are enough international organizations that are concerned with overfishing generally, are concerned about uh, conserving our natural resources generally, that it is possible even if Somalia as a government doesn't have the leverage to deal with trawlers from wealthy Middle Eastern countries or Japanese fisheries or, uh, or fishermen or, or Chinese fishing vessels, even if, if Somalia on its own can't patrol that, you may be able to make common cause with people who are concerned about oceans generally, and they may have more leverage and clout, which then allows uh, you to essentially uh, uh, ride on the, the work that those organizations may have done in their home countries or in the UN or in other uh, organizations that could end up having a positive impact. And you might be able to start a, a model program of uh, you know, policing uh, the, the, your coastal waters. That is one of the reasons, and I, I don't know whether you've been doing uh, these workshops, in these workshops, whether you've gotten this specific, but, but one thing that all of you should just get in the habit of doing is analyzing 
uh, who has power, influence on the particular problem or issue that you're working on. And, and you know, what, when I used to do workshops as a community organizer, I'd, I'd, I'd teach people in a very basic way to uh, do what we called a power analysis. And it was very simple. You know, we'd, we'd just get a big block of paper, and now I guess you could use an iPad or, you know, some, some fancy thing. But all, you don't have to have that. Just get some big paper, and you put it up on a wall. And you start asking yourself, okay, our concern is overfishing off the coast of Somalia. Who, how is this happening? Why is this happening? And, and so you start off with, well, okay, you know, yeah, here are uh, the countries whose ships uh, are doing the fishing. And, and are they commercial enterprises? Do, do their governments know that they're doing it? And you would analyze that. You know, then you'd go next and you'd say, all right, who in Somalia has any kind of influence, impact, or decision-making around what happens in the waters? And you'd start mapping out, well, there's somebody in the government who's supposed to be in charge of this, et cetera. Are there any companies that are involved that could be targeted? Because maybe it turns out that some of these fisheries are, are taking out fish and then they're selling them in supermarkets in fancy countries uh, in Europe. And if you started a boycott and those companies got embarrassed, then that might prompt them to change who they were buying their fish from, which in turn might have an impact and, and give you... Right, so you, you'd start evaluating... Uh, how is this thing happening? And you do that before you then put together a plan for how you're going to solve the problem. And, and it's interesting, we, we oftentimes don't take the time just to kind of think things through, right? Uh, you know, uh, we, we were talking about uh, in Tunisia. Uh, remind me of your name? Fatih is, has started uh, a, a coding courses and programs for young people to get them involved in coding. She's been working mostly with private schools. Now she's trying to think, how can I expand potentially to uh, the public schools in Tunisia? Well, before you get started, you'd want to know who's making decisions about funding public schools in Tunisia, what companies are already providing services to the education system in Tunisia? Who's getting those contracts? At what level are people deciding whether some, uh, some portion of a curriculum comes in or not? Is it done at the principal's level of a school or is it done at a, you know, a, a regional board? You can save your yourself a lot of time and energy <laughs> and, mis and, and avoid a lot of mistakes just by doing the research and then shaping uh, your plan around where the, the, the points of entry are for you to start having an impact. Now, one thing that may happen, I'm going to be honest, you may do that analysis and discover, I don't have leverage here. It's, 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 a, it's an issue that's too big. It's out of reach for me right now. So maybe what I should be focusing on is let me, let me focus on a, a more local thing that I can get done right now that then builds allies, colleagues, other organizations, and, and, and slowly we're building more power, more influence, so that we can eventually take on an issue that involves international uh, organizations and, and international commerce. And... and you want to be bold, and you want to be aggressive, but you also want to be realistic about what are the steps that you can take right in front of you. you know, if, if you see a mountain, I want you to all believe that you can scale the mountain, but you're not going to just hop up the mountain you know, uh, in a day. You've got to figure out, before you start looking at the peak, 
what, what, what are the paths and where, where can I set up a base camp and what kind of supplies am I going to get? And, you know, uh, how do I get used to the altitude? Right? And, and, and that kind of strategic work is something that all of you have to practice doing. And it's not as complicated as I think sometimes people make it out to be. You know, uh, uh, and, and th this is, by the way, where uh, sometimes business and business practices are useful to adopt, even if what you're doing is in the nonprofit sector, because they're accustomed to having to think in those terms because everything is reduced to balance sheets and numbers and you know, dollars and cents or whatever. Uh, your currency happens to be. And uh, so, so we, we can provide you with, when you start honing in on some of these problems, we can provide you the resources to potentially start figuring out how to think through it. But, but I guess uh, what I was going to say about business is there, there, was, a, there was a famous uh, management expert named Peter Drucker. Um, and he wrote a lot about management. He was, was one of the early management gurus. And you don't have to read his entire book because they're really long. Um, but, but there's one line that is really helpful to keep in your mind. Uh, and that is uh, most organizations uh, spend a lot of time thinking about doing things right. But... Actually, the first thing you should do is to make sure you're doing the right thing. All right? So, so if, if you do a great job building a road through a jungle, perfectly engineered, got all your resources, et cetera, but you went to the wrong place, that's not good. And you, so so you, you've got to spend a little more time thinking about are we, where are we going? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? All right. Uh, whoa. All right. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. No, I. You know, I. I, I was told that, that in the previous panels they were calling on all the people in the front. I got. I got to. That's the story I heard. That's that's the word on the street. That gentleman right 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 there in the suit, right on the right on the corner there. What an honor. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Robert Katende from Uganda, the executive director of Sports Outreach. We use sports to restore hope and transform lives. I'm the founder of Somchess Academy, a program that inspired the Disney movie Queen of Katwe. Oh, yeah, that was a great move. Without unity and love for each other, it will be so hard for Africa to get better. Mr. President, what is your take on the idea of having the United States of Africa? Do you think it's a remedy that can help us overcome the political conflicts that have claimed lives and held many countries behind. Thank you. Well, I, I, I believe that, and I spoke about this yesterday, that our North Star, our, our long-term goal, is for us to unify and recognize our common humanity uh, and, and work together to, to build a better life for every child on this planet. Um, you know, I before I... Before I came here, I was, as I told you in, in uh, uh, 
my father's village. Before that, I actually was out on safari for a few days um, in Tanzania. And, uh, you know, one of the great things about being out in the open, uh, b being in, in uh, the wild, is it gets you back down to basics. And, you know, you're seeing hyena eating wildebeest and lions, you know, sleeping most of the time and, you know, elephants you know, in their herds, and um, and at its most basic, the 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 idea, the fact that uh, humans actually make these distinctions between each other because uh, their hair is a little bit different, or they're a little darker or lighter, would be the equivalent of you know seeing a, uh, an elephant uh, with uh, you know, slightly smaller ears and, and saying, oh, you know, that's a completely different animal. Uh, it, it is so obvious that we're the same and that we have common hopes and dreams and aspirations that uh, it, it's hard to it, it's hard to figure out why we're so stupid around this issue, uh, and, and and I believe that's true between uh, blacks, Asians, whites. Then you end up having even among folks who are all black, <laughs> they start making distinctions, and they start deciding oh. Well, that person has a slightly different dialect. Let me kill him. Or let me just take his food or his land. Um, so, yes, the aspiration of unity, I think, is one that we all should be striving for. Uh, realistically, I'd, be, I'd, I'd settle right now for, like, a unified Kenya. Uh, or a unified Uganda, or a, a unified, uh, I, I, a unified Cameroon. I, I, I'd start with, can we all get along just within the existing borders that we've got? And if we were able to do that, then we could start having a conversation about Pan-African unity. Um, now, look, I, we, we all know the reasons why it, it, it's in some cases been particularly hard in Africa, right? You have uh, uh, national boundaries that did not correspond to traditional uh, uh, tribal or clan boundaries. Uh, and, and, and so we, we, you know, we understand the legacy of colonialism and all that. There does come a point at which uh, I think Africa is going to have to say no more excuses. Uh, yeah, we, we know what happened in the past, but in almost every, in, in every country basically in Africa, Africans have been in charge of the country for a very long time, right? Ken Kenya was, was uh, gained independence in, in, in 1963. I was two years old. And here's a good statistic to keep in mind. Kenya had the same per capita GDP in 1963 as the Republic of South Korea. The same. And now, 10, 15 fold. Um, and it's not as if Korea doesn't have corruption and uh, all kinds of different problems, but it does mean that at a certain point it, it fortified itself and focused and said, let's, let's get moving. So, so you, are, you are correct in identifying the problem. I think before we start getting into Pan-African unity, uh, each of you should be focused uh, and working on how within your own countries you can uh, develop some cohesion. 
but create a network of like minds that's pan-African. That's what you're starting here today, to exchange ideas and best practices and to learn from each other and to build. And commercially, I think the abilities of creating uh, effective African markets, uh, that is something that can be done. For example, on this continent, the fact that you have infrastructure that makes it easier to send products to Spain or Paris than to your neighboring country, that's a problem. That's the kind of uh, integration that doesn't, you know, presume an all African government. It just means the two governments are having enough of a conversation. They say, hey, let's build a train. <laughs> so our farmers and your farmers, or, or power is a perfect example. Somebody mentioned earlier the issue of power. When I was in the White House, we started something called Power Africa. Um, you know, oftentimes, to get the, the economies of scale, particularly for clean energy, you should be doing it across national boundaries based on are there geothermal resources or, uh, you know, if, if, if we want to create uh, a, 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 a storage, uh, energy storage facility that then is distributing across a rural area. That may, the, the most efficient way of doing it may not correspond to um, national boundaries. That kind of cooperation we should be able to do right now. Um, that, that doesn't require a, a United States of, uh, of Africa to get done. It does require governments uh, with some sense and focus uh, and attention. Okay. Uh, you know what? How about how about the, uh, the how about the person who waved like the flag? I mean, that's, that's, that's like you know the. the uh, I mean, I, I I I will say that's cheating a little bit, <laughs> but but that's okay. I decided to go ahead and call on you anyway. It was planned. Thank you, sir. Please, can I call you Uncle Obama? Yeah, why not? <laughs> I bring greetings from my friends from Cameroon. All of them are like, please greet him for me. So uh, my question is... What's your name? Emilia Miki from Cameroon. Okay. And, and what do you do? I am the founder and CEO of Dennis Miki Foundation. It's a non-profit organization I did in memorial for my dad, who passed away when I was 14 years old. And I had to school myself from then till I had a master's degree. And I help young girls and women in my community to empower themselves. So I have a very... <laughs> My question is, with the work I've been doing in the community for the past eight years, yeah. I've gained traction, and I have a lot of political parties coming to me now, like, we want you to be in our party. And since you made a choice to choose a political party, what were the values you found in the political party before you became a member? Because I'm at a point where I don't want to get into the wrong party and lose my values. So what did you use as values to choose a political party? And... Can we dance with you? Because you said yesterday you're a good dancer. When do we dance with you? Well, uh, I don't know if there's a dance party planned. I, I, I know we're going to go do some community service. Um, if, if somebody's got, you know, like a, a beats or a boom box and we start getting some music going. Now, I will say... Uh, if we're doing painting, though, we can't dance while we're painting because then it's going gonna, it's gonna to look terrible. But, but we could have a little dance break. Uh, so, so, all right. So that, that, that's on that front. Um, it, uh, the United States is, is uh, uh, somewhat unique in its political system uh, because of the, the way we... Uh, the way our voting rules are set up, you haven't seen the evolution of multi-party systems 
and we don't have a parliamentary system, so you don't get a percentage. You know, if you get a certain percentage of vote, then you get a certain percentage of seats. Uh, it's, it's very much winner take all. And as a consequence, what's involved is essentially a two-party system. Uh, occasionally, third parties have emerged, but they have uh, fairly quickly been absorbed by one of the major two parties, partly because of voting rules. So you essentially have the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Um, I, I don't think anybody's born uh, with a party label. <laughs> The last I checked, babies don't get printed. Uh, oh, Democrat, Republican. Uh, obviously, family has, has influence, history, uh, regional preferences uh, can have an impact. Um, for me, the question was, given the values that, uh, that I believe in, given the vision, of, of the kind of world I want to create, which of the two parties at that particular point in time best reflected those values and that vision. Um, in the United States, there was a time where I might have been a Republican because Abraham Lincoln was a Republican and at that time it was the Republican Party that was opposing uh, the expansion of slavery in the United, in the United States. Um, today, it's the Democratic Party that reflects the values that I spoke about at the lecture, at the Mandela lecture yesterday. Um, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that will always be the case. It doesn't mean that in every instance I've agreed with the Democratic Party platform, but broadly speaking, when you look at who's been concerned about broad-based economic growth, who's been concerned about civil rights, who's been most supportive in uh, making sure that uh, women are treated fairly in the workplace, who's supported collective bargaining, you know, uh, who, who uh, has been most concerned with uh, environmental uh, issues, including climate change. Right now, that happens to be the Democratic Party. That, and, and again, that wasn't always the case. There used to be more variation and different ideological views even within the parties. So you, you, know, uh, you might have more flexibility. I don't know enough about Cameroonian politics to know how you would uh, think about it. Uh, the, the one thing I would be cautious about would be uh, if there are parties that are primarily organized around uh, uh, ethnic or tribal lines, and that's really the only rationale they have for being a party. It's not based on principles, it's not based on platform, it's not based on ideas. Then uh, that's how over time I think parties get in trouble. Because then, th then it's really just about, uh, you know, we're not starting the dance party yet, so whoever's got the, uh, uh, you know, Part of the reason that you end up getting corruption in government is if you are organizing on the basis of clan or tribe and you don't have any platform or principles underlying it, then typically the question is, all right, has our clan or tribe won? And once it has, we then divide up the spoils. Right? Because the only thing, the only reason anybody supported you is, well, you know, your Luo or your Kikuyu or your Bantu or your Hosa or wh whatever it is. And if, if that's the basis for keeping people together, then once somebody's in power, they don't have an agenda. They don't have a, the, the, the only question is, oh, well, who, who's getting the jobs? Who's getting the contracts? Who's getting the bribes? Uh, it's, it's one of the dangers of that kind of politics. So, so I, I, I think the most important thing is think about the platform and the policies and what, what you believe in, all right? Last question? Just relax. We're, you know, we're going to be on the Internet. We're going to be hanging out. This is just the start. This is our first conversation. It's not our last. Uh, 
Hold on a second. Just let me let me let me kind of take a look here. Uh, I don't know. I'm I, I'm just so. It's so confusing. It's everybody's so good looking and and every. Okay. Wait. 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 First, here, here's here's how I'm going to sort out. First of all, if somebody from your country has already been called on, keep your hands down. All right. So so what do we got? The, 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 what, what's, what's the guy in the, you, South Africa, they're, they're our hosts, so South Africa, go ahead. We got to, uh, you know, we, 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 had, we had to give our hosts a little preferential treatment. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. President, you made a good choice. <laughs> if I do say so myself. My name is Mandla, I am from Johannesburg. And I work for the Ministry of Home Affairs. Mm -hmm. We stamped your passport when you flew in. Thank you very much. Uh, um, the question I have for you is around gatekeeping and the old guard. You know, you talked about not starting out with political ambitions, but eventually you had them. Yeah. And myself and a lot of young South Africans that do have political aspirations, what we find is that there's an old guard that wants to dictate who gets opportunities and who gets to enter the space. And, it's, and we feel we have vision and skills and things to offer. But there's an old guard that seems to say, you have to look like this, you have to sound like this. Mm -hmm. um, and so how did you break through that? We're, we're idealists like you were. And we feel like we want to change things and offer something new. How did you break through you know, the old guard that wanted to dictate to you at the time uh, when you were trying to run for office? Yeah. Thank well, you. well, first of all, First of all, old heads are everywhere uh, who want to keep things the way they are. That, that's the nature of, of humans. Um, that's not unique to South Africa. Uh, and by the way, it's not unique to politics. Right? There is an old guard in business that wants to protect how they do things. And there's an old guard in, in art that says you know, to Picasso, what you're doing is crazy. You know, why, you know, it doesn't even look like it's supposed to, and right, I, you know. So, so that's the history of of humanity. It's not unique to South Africa or Africa. What is true, I think, is that in politics, I was, I was talking to some some folks about this earlier. Um, one disadvantage that uh, African politics has is that. When politicians leave office, they don't have some place to land. Uh, a lot of times, in, in many of our countries, in Africa, it, it, you know, it's like that's where you are going to have the most power, the most economic influence, etc. In America, you know, if you retire from politics, oh, you might join a corporate board or some investment bank will hire you to give advice and create a. And, and or you you might end up getting a teaching post and and so uh, it can at least encourage some people to make way uh, and here oftentimes those options don't exist now it goes back to the point I was making earlier about tribalism though and 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 that kind of politics sometimes what happens also is leaders they may be ready to go but all their cousins and friends and the people who've been making money off them having that position say, no, 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 you can't go because this is our whole economic engine here. Right? All right. So now, having said all that, uh, I don't think there's a formula here. I think you just have to go for it. I, I, now, you have to be strategic about it, but, but this is where a politics that mobilizes the grassroots 
is more likely to break through than a politics that is based on transactions. Right? If, 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 if you are trying to maneuver to have the right sponsor and the you know, right patron and you're going to get slotted and, uh, you know, and it, then you may have to wait a long time because that's just the nature of those transactions. But if you are mobilizing young people or you're mobilizing you know, farmers who feel that nobody's paying attention to them or you're, you're mobilizing uh, college students who are unemployed or you are doing something that is showing that you're making a difference, then nobody can take that base from you. It's not dependent on somebody from the top. It's coming from people. You've earned it from the bottom. And, and I, I think that ends up making the biggest difference. When I ran for president in 2008, I, you know, I had been fairly well known at that point uh, because of, of uh, a speech I had given at the Democratic Convention. I would gotten a lot of coverage and a lot of publicity. I would written several books. But I was running against somebody who was much better known, and the establishment was much more supportive. Uh, but I just got a bunch of 25-year-olds and 20-year-olds and trained them and said, here, let, let's go knock on doors and talk to people. And they out-organized everybody because they were hungry and they were motivated and they believed in something. And we surprised people. Uh, if, I had, if I had been trying to do it transactionally, it would not have worked. Um, now, one last thing I want to say, though, about politics and the relationship between politics and what you're doing. You know, I used to have these White House interns uh, come in on a regular cycle. It's part of a White House internship program. And I, I would uh, typically get them together at, at the end of their time at the White House, maybe every six months. And they'd ask me questions about and all of them were ambitious and eager and would talk about politics. And, and, and one piece of advice I always gave them that I, I, I'd like to leave you all with, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a piece of advice that somebody gave me once when I was a, a little younger than you, but I'd, I always carried it with me, and it served me well. Um, worry less about what you want to be and worry more about what you want to do. And, 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 and what I mean by that is uh, a lot of politicians think in terms of, I want to be governor, mayor, prime minister, president, member of parliament, whatever it is. So they see it as sort of a, a, a position to get, a, 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 a a prize to win. And they then blindly follow that ambition. But how they get there increasingly doesn't matter. And if, in fact, they do get there, they don't know what to do with it, except to just keep it. Now, they've been fighting all these years to finally, finally they've got their position, what do I do with it? Well, I keep it. If, on the other hand, you're worrying more about what do you want to do, and you say, what I want to do is make sure that every young person in Libya has the chance to read or I want to make sure that health in Tanzania is available to women in rural areas. Or I want to make sure that the internet uh, is providing you know, uh, access to capital for small businesses. If, if, if that is your mission, you may never become mayor, governor, prime minister, but 
during the 10 years that you would have been striving to try to get that position, you would have been helping thousands, ten thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And by the way, people will be watching the fact that you actually do what you say you wanted to do. And now, if you do decide to go into politics, you've got something to show. Other than your own ambition, you've actually got something that you've delivered. And if you don't make it, you can sleep well at night because you've lived a good life. And if you do make it, you actually know what you now want to do even more of because you've already learned from it. And that, that, by the way, does not just apply to politics. I, the, the, the business leaders I know who are most successful, typically they're successful because they were just really interested in what they decided they were going to do. They, you know, Bill Gates didn't start off saying, I'm going to be you know, the richest guy on earth. He was just a computer geek. Um, you know, the, the, typically, uh, really successful business leaders, they, they find something that just fascinates them, and they, it doesn't mean they don't have a business plan, it doesn't mean that money is not important, it, it, but, but there's something, a vision that they have about what they want to build. Huh? So, so don't just worry about what you want to be, worry about what you want to do. All right? No, I think we got to go get to do some work. So I'm proud of all of you. I'm going to see you guys soon. All right.